Welcome to CMES Conversations, a series of interviews with leading scholars and thinkers hosted by the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver. This week's guest on CMES Conversations is the award-winning journalist Reese Ehrlich. Ehrlich is a special correspondent with Global Post and reports regularly for National Public Radio, the Canadian Broadcast Corporation, and Radio Deutsche Welle. He is the author of several books, including Target Iraq, What the News Media Didn't Tell You, co-authored with Norman Solomon. The Iran Agenda, the real story of U.S. policy and the Middle East crisis. Conversations with terrorists, Middle East leaders on politics, violence, and empire. And lastly, and most recently, Inside Syria, the backstory of their civil war and what the world can expect. Thank you for joining us on this episode of CMES Conversations. Well, Reese, it is great to have you back in Denver and to have you here at the University of Denver. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been reading your book, Inside Syria. Um, it's a very powerful book. And before we get into some of the substance of what I'd like to discuss with you about the Syrian war, I'd like to ask you about the book itself as a book. You're one of the few Western journalists who spent significant time in Syria. In the book, you talk about some of your travels to Syria before the uprising in 2011. You were there in the 2000s. Talk about that a little bit. Talk about the various reporting trips that you've made to Syria. You were also in Syria really soon after the uprising started in 2011, mm -hmm. and you were in parts of the country. As I was reading the book, I was thinking, my God, I mean, these are pretty dicey situations. I mean, there aren't many Western journalists left inside Syria now. And some of the places that you describe and some of the meetings that you had, these are kind of uh, dicey and, and precarious situations that you put yourself in. Well, you have to remember that in the 2000s, Syria was kind of off the map as far as American journalists were concerned. You get occasional stories from there. It usually had to do with something uh, with the Syrian government, uh, human rights abuses perhaps, or uh, something to do with Syria and Iran, but very little uh, was covered about ordinary people in Syria or the policies internal to the government of Syria. I first went in 2002 and went back a total of five times. And uh, Syria was a relatively stable, it was a sectarian, uh, sorry, a secular dictatorship. Uh, it was not the most brutal in the Middle East, although it was clearly quite repressive of the people, particularly the Kurds and other uh, minority peoples in Syria. And dissidents. And dissidents of any kind, whether you're on the left or a political Islamist. There was no toleration of dissent, either under uh, Bashar al-Assad or his father, Hafez al-Assad. Uh, but as a journalist, I was able to um, get around freely. Uh, I worked with a local fixer that I had known for many years. Uh, managed to get uh, interviews with dissidents and opposition figures as well as with government officials. Uh, and then, of course, that all changed in 2011 when the uprising began in March. And, and talk about some of your reporting in Syria after the uprising. I was able to go back twice as well as visit with Syrians in exile in Turkey and Lebanon and other neighboring countries. And uh, the, the situation had changed drastically. The government had really shown its true colors, was uh, violently repressing what had begun as a movement of civil society activists, that is secular progressives who wanted to see a change in establishing a parliamentary system combined with a conservative political Islamists such as the Muslim Brotherhood who were also committed to having a parliamentary system, although from a conservative perspective. But the, the extremist groups that we know today didn't exist in the beginning. And these, these both... No foreign fighters, no jihadis. The, they were, the government claimed from the very beginning that Afghans and all manner of foreigners were there shooting from rooftops into the demonstrators and then blaming on the government. They had all manner of wild conspiracy theories. In reality, no. This was an indigenous Syrian uprising for political and economic rights. And we've... No, we've heard about the political rights, the lack of the, thereof, but also there was high unemployment. 
There was uh, a great deal of economic discontent. College graduates couldn't find jobs. And uh, that was one of the underlying factors that led to the uprising. In fact, you've even likened the Syrian protest movement in those early months from about March 2011 until the end of 2011. You've even likened that movement to the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, absolutely. A lot of similarity. You may recall that the people in Tahir Square in Egypt raised signs saying we are Occupy and the occupiers in New York City expressed their solidarity with the Arab Spring uprising. Absolutely. Were, in fact, I was in Madison, Wisconsin um, with the labor protests mm -hmm. in 2011 and there were pizzas being sent from the protesters in Tahrir Square in Cairo to those labor activists occupying the state house the state capital in Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah, who would have thought there was a Caesar's Pizza in Tehran? I mean, in uh, Cairo. <laughs> in Cairo. But, uh, yes. but anyway, yes. Uh, so, but the composition of the protesters were very similar. You had young, relatively inexperienced, new to politics, but, de but dedicated, uh, angry young people demonstrating for their rights. And that's what they were brutally crushed by the uh, Assad government. And uh, they, Eventually, after 2011, people turned to armed struggle in an effort to fight uh, the government. And you write on page 90 um, in your very vivid and moving chapter titled The Uprising Begins. It's one of the best, I think, accounts of the um, origins of the Syrian uprising and its early phase. You write, the shift away from nonviolent protest and toward armed struggle took place gradually peaceful protest became increasingly difficult. Security forces surrounded mosques on Friday afternoons to prevent marches. Any attempt to hold a rally was quickly and violently dispersed. Talk a little bit about that transition, Reese, from the nonviolent first few months of the protest to the armed phase of the struggle. Yeah, keep in mind that even in the early days, people were not engaged in Gandhian style nonviolence. Uh, if they were attacked by the police, they threw rocks back or anything that was available. In some cases, there were shots fired, there were attacks on the Ba'athist headquarters in Dara, for example. So it was not a Gandhian style nonviolent movement, but neither was it armed struggle. And what took place towards the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, was local groups in villages and neighborhoods who had access to arms or who took them from the security forces began an actual armed struggle shooting with the intention of overthrowing the government. Uh, and it was scattered, it was disorganized, it was not, if the CIA and the Israelis were really behind it, they were sure doing a lousy job because they were quite ineffectual in the early days. It had all the signs of a spontaneous movement as had arisen in Egypt and Tunisia before it. Um, and your reference there to the Israelis, but I, I, I imagine that what you mean by that is that the Assad regime yeah. and some of its defenders were claiming That's that right. even in that early period, before right. the uprising turned violent, that it was all a foreign conspiracy, it was terrorists, yeah. it was the Israelis, it was the Americans. Yeah. There's within, no evidence whatsoever for no. this. Within three weeks of the uprising, in March, or April, President Assad gave a speech blaming the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Israel for being behind the demonstration and that all of the demonstrators were Islamic extremists, uh, none of which was true. You're, you're very uh, sympathetic uh, to the early phase of the Syrian uprising and its aims, but you're also very critical in your account of how it evolved over time. And you write on page 88 that as the fighting intensified, the secular forces within the opposition we're losing strength. Mm -hmm. Talk about that, because that's really one of the central themes of your yeah. book, is how the uprising metamorphosed over that you know, following period after the initial phase. Yeah. Well, several things were happening simultaneously. The government was using divide and conquer tactics to divide the popular opposition. Initially, there was participation by Christians, by even some Alawites, by Shia Muslims, as well as the majority Sunni in the big protests. As well as secular forces. As well as secular forces. And other minorities like Druze, Ismailis, yeah. Kurds. Yeah, it was, it was not a Sunni uprising against the Alawite government as is sometimes portrayed. It was a right. cross-class, cross-religious, ethnic minorities 
all in opposition to the government in, in uh, Damascus. Well, Assad is no dummy, and he knew that the only way he was going to survive is if he could divide and conquer. So he drew on his Alawite base and convinced Christians and other minorities that they were going to be killed at the hands of these Islamic extremists if they joined the opposition. And he's told the same thing to the Kurds. And it had some impact, so that was part of it. And he adjusted his tactics in terms of who he was attacking to focus on the strongest forces, which were the secular and the conservative Islamists. And didn't allow, at a certain point, allow the extremists to grow intentionally. Uh, and as well as because that served his ends, because that served both his ends on the rhetorical level, which was that his narrative about the uprising was this is an extremist Islamic fundamentalist criminal uprising, and it's foreigners, and it's not a genuine, it's not the Syrian yeah. people, but also operationally, right? Because the yeah. Free Syrian Militarily, Army, yeah. militarily, because the the original. Um, rebel forces, the Free Sy which became known as the Free Syrian Army, they were um, largely these, these Islamist forces that ended up gaining strength. To the extent that they gained strength and attacked the Free Syrian Army and the more secular forces within the uprising, that helped Assad because that was Assad's main enemy. Yeah, absolutely. So that was one factor. The Assad government played a very clever divide and conquer strategy. Secondly, the secular forces were really inexperienced. Imagine if the Occupy movement had suddenly taken up arms <laughs> against the 1% and hmm. what would have happened. So they had no experience, they had no military uh, experience, they had been cut off from the previous generations of leftists who had existed in the country because they had all been jailed or exiled. So the inexperience of the secular forces was a factor. And we saw the same thing in Egypt where they got uh, the secular forces who had initiated the Tahrir Square demonstrations, got outmaneuvered by the conservative uh, Muslim Brotherhood and, and ultimately by the military. Uh, and finally, outside powers at a certain point did start to get involved. So Turkey and the U.S. helped form the Free Syrian Army. Uh, the Saudis were very much opposed politically and religiously to the Free Syrian Army and the Muslim Brotherhood, and they backed the extremist, the ultra-right-wing political Islamists, the Nusra Front, which was an affiliate of Al Qaeda, and which at that time contained the uh, people who later formed the Islamic, sta uh, Islamic State. ISIS. So, uh, yes, ISIS. So you had all of those factors coming together in the taking up of arms, and as the armed struggle continued, outside support went to the extremists, and they gradually became stronger and stronger, particularly since Assad initially didn't attack them, but it was focusing its fire on the Free Syrian Army. Weren't the Free Syrian Army, um, the leaders, the for those who formed the Free Syrian Army originally, didn't they actually defect from the Syrian army? And weren't they, in fact, um, very much popular figures in the midst of the Syrian uprising? W didn't they enjoy the support of protesters and opposition activists in Syria? It's complicated. Because the Free Syrian Army was never an uh, organized organ uh, army with a command and control st uh, structure. It was always a series of local militias. You might form a militia group with 10 or 20 of your friends from a neighborhood or a village, and then you'd ally with another similar group, and you call yourself the Free Syrian Army, but a month later you might ally with a different group. So that's the first thing. So the people who took up the armed struggle, including people who took the name Free Syrian Army, were a reflection of the popular sentiments against the Assad regime. Simultaneous with that, the Turks, particularly and with the U.S. support, took some of these former uh, Assad generals and officers and uh, deserters from the Syrian army, trained them in Turkey. The CIA, we now know, funded and armed them and tried to take the Free Syrian Army in a particular direction that would ultimately install a pro-U.S. regime in, in, in Syria. That's why it's complicated. And, and how did the U.S. do that, by the way? How could the U.S. impose that sort of political... Well, what they do is the same thing that they, they've done historically in Iran, in, back in the days of Mossadegh. They've done it in Guatemala. Well, that was and, just a coup. Well, it was a coup, but they found a pro-U.S. 
generals and the Shah to install in power. And that's exactly what they did with the Free Syrian Army. They found a general who was pliable, who was amenable to the U.S. goals, who could promise democracy, but in fact would impo impose pro-U.S. Uh, goals in, if, should he come to power, uh, and promoted him as the leader of the Free Syrian Army. The problem was they never really had the popular base that the U.S. claimed. They had to change. They formed a new military commission that was supposedly a wider coalition over the Free Syrian Army. They tried all manner of things until a warehouse full of American arms was captured by the extremist forces and the Free Syrian Army fled. Uh, that was an indication that it didn't really have a, much of a popular base. Reese, this leads us to what I think, and maybe you can help me clarify this. It seems to me that there's a tension in the narrative of your book regarding the role of the United States mm -hmm. in this whole complicated story. And the role of the United States figures very prominently in your book and in your, the talks that you're giving about the book. Um, on the one hand, you, as you just pointed out, the United States tried to shape the direction of the Free Syrian Army. The CIA helped train some of its um, fighters in Turkey. And there was some funding. At first, there was non-lethal aid that was um, provided from the United States. But you also point out, at various points in the book, that Free Syrian, free, free Syrian Army activists and fighters and other Syrian oppositionists have long felt that the United States has basically delivered chump change mm -hmm. to their cause, that they have not actually provided mm -hmm. the kinds of heavy weapons or anti-aircraft weapons that would allow them to mm -hmm. take out Assad's air force, defend various Syrian neighborhoods and territories from aerial attack, barrel bombs, etc. Um, and so t talk about this tension. It seems to me that you're saying two things simultaneously. One, that the United States had all of these designs and wanted to engineer yet another regime change in Damascus. And yet at the same time, uh, one part of your narrative is that the United States has done very little to help the Free Syrian Army and has in fact um, basically stayed out of the business of toppling Assad. Yes. What the book uh, says is that the, there's difference of opinions among the Syrian activists that I interviewed. Initially, some of them favored a no-fly zone that would have been enforced by the United States, which would have led to the toppling of Assad. Which never happened. Which never happened, wasn't going to happen, because the, uh, the U.S. had figured out from its experiences in Iraq that once you come in with a, a no-fly zone, you have to wipe out the air force of Syria, and ultimately you have to send in your own troops if you're going to secure it, and the U.S. people were never going to stand for yet another war of invasion and occupation. And I actually had some sharp discussions with the Syrians that I interviewed on exactly this topic. I said, look, you're being naive. You think the U.S. can come in, set up a no-fly zone, topple the government, and then go home. And they don't do that. They stay and they make sure their U.S. national interests are uh, enforced. So that was part of it. And that's reflected in the book. But it is important to note the different opinions. And I also met Syrians who are adamantly opposed to any U.S. intervention at all. Uh, they were simply different opinions. Now I think overwhelmingly the sentiment is against in, uh, inter U.S. intervention because of all, everything that's happened since. The other thing is that um, you, you were saying uh, about the tension of what the U.S. should be doing. The U.S. actually tried supporting the rebel forces that it sought to control. The non-jihadi forces. The, yes, the conservative and moderate and uh, secular forces. They tried tried and true methods that has, have worked in the past. The U.S. empire is weaker today, the direct result of the failure of, and of losing in Iraq. There's not the money, there's not the military capability, and there's not the political will to fight yet another war of occupation. And Obama actually, it's not like, oh, if only Obama had provided stinger missiles to the rebels, somehow that would have toppled Assad. What would happen after Assad was toppled? The pro-U.S. forces did not have the strength inside Syria to govern and keep the country together. You either had the extremist forces taking over or 
the country turning into a failed state. And that was the problem that Obama faces and he's, he continues to face today. So you're of the view that the, we're talking about a three-way war here that developed. Mm -hmm. You have the Assad regime in one corner, the original rebels slash Free Syrian Army. Well, no, see, I disagree that the original arm, uh, rebels uh, represented the Free Syrian Army. The Free Syrian Army people that I interviewed were all conservative Islamists. This, the secular forces, unfortunately, have way diminished in their ability to influence and have pretty much since the first year of the uprising. Well, what I remember from your book is that you talked about the chameleon-like character of some of these Free Syrian right. Army figures, that depending on who they were talking to, they could go Islamist or they could go secular. Yeah. So when they were trying to appeal to the Americans, they spoke a secular lingo right. and came across as very modern and Western. But when they were trying, when they were seeking Saudi funding and support, right. they grew their beards longer, yeah. they prayed five times a day and came across as much more pious. Yeah, absolutely, they did that and the conservative to extremist Islamist trend won. And the proof of that is there's the U.S. is bombing in Syria today. It seeks allies on the ground to hold territory, and the U.S. has no allies. So whatever the U.S. intention was in building up the Free Syrian Army, they lost. The bombing that the United States is doing inside Syria today, Reese, is not against the Assad regime, but it's rather against ISIS. And it's bombed a couple of other jihadi groups and al-Qaeda affiliate and so forth. But it's essentially an operation against the Islamic State. Um, you're of the view that most Syrians don't support this? No, I don't think so. And it's an unusual coalition, but it's the majority. So the Assad government is tactically willing to accept the bombing because they really don't have any choice. And it's helping them. But they, they, I think if you put it to a vote, even among Assad supporters, they would not favor the U.S. bombing because they know eventually the bombing is going to come against them. And the f extremist rebels obviously don't for reasons that they're the ones getting killed. Right. And even the Free Syrian Army and the less extremist of the rebel groups, they also oppose it because they see it as a way of supporting Assad by making ISIS the main enemy. So whether for different reasons, yeah. most Syrians today, I think, oppose the bombing. It's an interesting point. There is one group of Syrians that clearly has not only supported it, but participated in the operations, which is the Syrian Kurds yes. in Rojava, the yeah. north, the northern Kurdish-dominated region on the Syrian-Turkish border, yes. most famous for the town of Kobani, yeah. where some of the most dramatic battles mm -hmm. between, well, between ISIS and the Syrian Kurdish forces themselves. But then, this is the key, the United States came in and began conducting airstrikes in support of the Syrian Kurdish forces. And only recently, after several weeks of intense fighting, uh, the, through a combination of the airstrikes and the Syrian Kurdish fighters on the ground, who are quite formidable, yeah. um, ISIS was driven out of Kobani. Yes. So that, Unfortunately, Kobani was destroyed in the process. Absolutely, yeah. although the Syrian Kurds are now in a process of rebuilding and, and moving forward. But um, it is a tragic um, uh, story, but that it has something of a happy ending that this... Um, it's, it's good that the Islamic State was defeated in Kobani, absolutely. So you agree with that, yeah. and yet you oppose any bombing, and so how can you have it both ways? Well, it's, uh, first of all, back to your earlier question, the Kurds make up perhaps 10%, maybe a little bit more, so the fact that they're supporting the bombing is still a small percentage of the Syrian population as a whole. But it's true, the Kurds, and of course the irony is that the group that fought the hardest and was at the forefront of the battle in Kobani was, in the, was the, called the PYD, which is an affiliate of the PKK or the Kurdistan Workers Party, which is left wing. A, which is a well, I don't think so. I think they were their origins were as Marxists and nationalists. They've dropped the Marxism a long time ago. They're a straight up nationalist group, and the fact that they're calling for an alliance with the U.S. should be some indication. Well, uh, of course, if it's, you... it's more than a tactical alliance because I've interviewed their people. They want a long term strategic alliance with the U.S. As do the more conservative. Iraqi Kurdish leaders in Erbil. Reese, you're against military intervention to bring ISIS down. 
what then do you think is going to happen? What is going to be the fate of those people we see, mm -hmm. you know, the ISIS death machine march on yeah. through this region, through this fairly significant swath yeah. of territory they've laid claim to, roughly the size of Great Britain. They are murdering civilians. They are now, we have evidence that they have buried children alive, um, sold uh, uh, many, many women into slavery. Um, they are in, engaged in a kind of indiscriminate, uh, nihilistic uh, death march. What, what do you think is the answer? Well, there's no question that the Islamic State is a human rights violating set of war criminals. They're an ultra-reactionary group that has nothing in common with Islam and everything about putting themselves in power for their own enrichment and political power. They also have the seeds of their own destruction. When they rule an area, their rule is so harsh that in the short run it works because they can murder, intimidate, ethnically cleanse, and, and intimidate people. But that you can't govern for any length of time with that. And there have already been rebellions against them in Syria, and I think we're going to see more of that. Secondly, the only places that they can function would be in the Sunni-dominated regions of Syria and parts of Iraq. They're not going to take Baghdad. They're not going to take Erbil, where the Kurds are because the population is overwhelmingly opposed to them and they can't kill the entire Kurdish population either practically or any other way because the Kurds would fight against them. But, so but th Syria is 70% Sunni. Yeah, but even in Syria they've not been able to penetrate um, in certain areas. So the south of uh, Syria is still under Free Syrian Army or other rebel controls. They've controlled an area in the north around the city of Raqqa and up through Idlib and, and over towards the Deir Ezzor, but they've even ran into uh, limits in terms of what. So as horrible as they are, it's not like they're going to overrun the entire region and set up a caliphate. Um, and ultimately, the people of the region have to fight it themselves. The U.S. admits that by bombing, they can't win the war. They have to have somebody in Iraq and in Syria who's capable of taking over, fighting, and then holding and governing the cities. And by the fact that they're being sponsored by the U.S. actually politically undermines those forces. Uh, and as horrible as, you know, the, the U.S. bombing in the long run actually gives political legitimacy to a group that was a horrible local group. Now they're a horrible international group uh, recruiting people around the world claiming to be fighters against imperialism and Zionism. So the U.S. and militarily, frankly, they're not doing so great. We have Kobani because there were fierce fighters on the ground. But what about Mosul? What about all the cities in Iraq that they had taken? The, the U.S. bombing has not stopped it, nor is there any indication that it will. So while it sounds like somehow you're being uncaring to the people of the region by saying the U.S. should stop the bombing, the bombing isn't doing all that much good. And finally, you know, there's lots of atrocities going on around the world. Horrible, horrible human rights violations in Nigeria with Boko Haram. At times, the killings by Boko Haram has outstripped anything the Islamic State has done. Does that mean the United States should invade and occupy in, in Nigeria or send in troops or humanitarian effort, military efforts? No. There's times, uh, you know, when, it makes absolute, when, when military intervention makes the situation worse. Final question, Reese. Where do you see things going? The subtitle of your book is What the World Can Expect. Where does Syria go from here? What's the end result of all of this? In the short run, unfortunately, we're going to see a lot more fighting, turmoil, death. Uh, U.S. bombing makes it worse. The Islamic State is carrying out horrific crimes. The Assad government is carrying out horrific crimes. Uh, everybody still thinks they can win. And in that situation, you don't have peace and stability. But I also remember the Lebanese civil war of the 1970s and 80s when it seemed like that war was intractable. This, the Lebanese Christians and Muslims were fighting each other, kidnapping, bombings. It was horrific. After 15 years, people finally figured out this war is going nowhere. The people of Lebanon, without outside interference, sat down, reached a political solution, return to stability. It's not like there was a great democratic awakening, but there was political stability of return to a parliamentary system. I think particularly if foreign intervention can be stopped or reduced, the people of Syria will be able to form a, a stable government, not necessarily a, a democratic one, but at least to bring peace and allow po progressive forces to organize and, and try and develop uh, some political strength. 
When you say foreign intervention, this is, I think, an important point that you emphasize in the book that in, in the U.S. we tend to focus on U.S. intervention, right? Mm -hmm. Especially anti-war activists and leftists, the issue is always stopping U.S. intervention. What you point out in the book is that actually Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah have played a very significant role in the Syrian war, more significant actually than the United States. Well, I would argue. Okay, I'm not so sure about that, but I, the book very clearly takes a stand against all foreign intervention. U.S., Turkey, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates on supporting the rebels, and Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah supporting the, the uh, Syrian government. There's not going to be peace in the area until all of those powers significantly reduce both their political and military interference in Syria. And I firmly believe that. I think if uh, the U.S. were to stop its intervention and pressure Saudi Arabia and Turkey to do the same, I think the Iranians and the Russians could also be pressured. They're not irrevocably committed to Assad. I've interviewed diplomats and analysts in both of those countries. And if Assad was gone, but there was a government not hostile to Iran or to Russia, they could live with that. And I think that's, that, that's the potential solution to the problem. But again, when you say that the United States should stop its intervention, mm -hmm. what specifically do you mean? Are you talking now about its support for FSA forces, or are you talking about its all, bombing all of, of ISIS? All of the above, the bombing and the, the uh, army. Remember, the U.S. now has a plan to train 5,000 moderate rebels, starting from scratch, sending them to Saudi Arabia to be tutored in moderation, presumably, <laughs> and then sent back to Syria. That's intervention. Uh, the CIA is continuing. But that's to very to different from Iran directly sending Revolutionary Guard forces and Hezbollah yeah. fighters directly into Syria to engage in battle, major battles. That's okay. very different. There are no U.S. troops fighting not directly yet, not yet, in Syria. Not yet. The, tr the pressure is on the U.S. if the bombing doesn't work for the U.S. to introduce troops. That is the pressure. We'll see. We'll come back in another year and talk again. But that's to fight ISIS, not to topple Assad. There's never, this is my point, Reese. This is why I keep pushing this. Many people on the left have been saying from day one that the key thing about Syria is to stop U.S. intervention. We have to stop U.S. intervention. Obviously, the one time when there was actually a serious possibility of U.S. intervention was in August, September of 2013 after the chemical weapons attack. Obama proposed a military strike on Syria in response to that chemical weapons mm -hmm. attack. The British considered it. Parliament voted it down. Obama punted to Congress. Congress obviously wouldn't have gone for it. Mm -hmm. Obama saw the writing on the wall. If Obama had really wanted to intervene in Syria, by the way, he wouldn't have punted to Congress, especially after the British Parliament. Well, I, th I think he wanted to, but he realized that the overwhelming popular sentiment in the United States and in Britain and in key allies was against intervention. Which he, is he faced yeah. the real de danger of impeachment had he simply uni uh, unilaterally intervened. Which is I why think he, I think he really wanted to. But well, that's, that's, whether that's he did or he didn't, the right. Syrian war is now three and a half years old, and almost four years old. The the military aspect of it is three and a half years old. And there has been no direct U.S. military intervention on the ground. There has been no U.S. bombing against the Assad regime. Zero in three and a half years. My point is there are many people in the anti-war movement and the left who have one song only that they can sing, which is no to U.S. intervention. My point is this. That call, correct as it may be, is basically irrelevant and out of touch with the reality of what has been happening for the last three and a half years. Well, the United you're, States you're, has played virtually no role in, tr in toppling Assad's regime. So no, to that's, that's not true. They tried and failed. Let me put it this way. You talk about the single song. I sing with a chorus. <laughs> and the chorus sings no intervention from any outside power. And I, and, and I and agree with that. No to Hezbollah, Iran, and Russia. No to US, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. You are exceptional in that sense, partly because I think you know the story of Syria very intimately. Yeah, You've been there. You've you, reported it. That's because you haven't heard me sing. I have, <laughs> I have a lousy voice. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Reese. it's been a pleasure, and I want to congratulate you again on Thank this you. very important book. Thank you.